Chapter Twenty Eight of Our Village, Volume One by Mary Russell Mitford. Read by Anne Fletcher, Hobart, two thousand and twenty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Our Village, Volume One, Chapter Twenty Eight The Talking Gentleman. The Lords of the Creation, who are generally, to do them justice, tenacious enough of their distinctive and peculiar faculties and powers, have yet by common consent made over to the females the single gift of loquacity every man thinks and says that every woman talks more than he it is the creed of the whole sex the debates and law reports notwithstanding and every masculine eye that has scanned my title has already i doubt not looked to the errata suspecting a mistake in the gender but it is their misconception not my mistake i do not heaven forbid intend to impugn or abrogate our female privilege i do not dispute that we do excel generally speaking in the use of the tongue i only mean to assert that one gentleman does exist whom i have the pleasure of knowing intimately who stands pre-eminent and unrivalled in the art of talking unmatched and unapproached by man woman or child since the decease of my poor friend the talking lady who dropped down speechless in the midst of a long story about nine weeks ago and was immediately known to be dead by her silence i should be at a loss where to seek a competitor to contend with him in a race of words and i should be still more puzzled to find one that can match him in wit pleasantry or good humour my friend is usually called harry l for though a man of substance a lord of land a magistrate a field officer of militia nobody ever dreamed of calling him mr or major or by any such derogatory title he is and will be all his life plain harry the name of universal good will he is indeed the pleasantest fellow that lives his talk one can hardly call it conversation as that would seem to imply another interlocutor something like reciprocity is an incessant flow of good things like congreve's comedies without a replying speaker or joe miller laid into one and its perpetual stream is not lost and dispersed by diffusion but runs in one constant channel playing and sparkling like a fountain the delight and ornament of our good town of b harry l is a perfect example of provincial reputation of local fame there is not an urchin in the town that hasn't heard of him nor an old woman that doesn't chuckle by anticipation at his approach the citizens of b are as proud of him as the citizens of antwerp were of the chapeau de paille and they have the advantage of the luckless flemings in the certainty that their boast is not to be purchased harry like the flemish beauty is native to the spot for he was born at b educated at b and married at b though as his beautiful wife brought him a good estate in a distant part of the country there seemed at that epoch of his history some danger of his being lost to our ancient borough but he is a social and gregarious animal so he leaves his pretty place in devonshire to take care of itself and lives here in the midst of a hive his tastes are not at all rural he's no sportsman no farmer no lover of strong exercise when at b his walks are quite regular from his own house on one side of the town to a gossip shop called literary on the other where he talks and reads newspapers and others read newspapers and listen thence he proceeds to another house of news similar in kind though differing in name in an opposite quarter where he and his hearers undergo the same process and then he returns home forming a pretty exact triangle of about half a mile this is his daily exercise or rather his daily walk of exercise he takes abundance not only in talking though that is nearly as good to open the chest as the dumbbells but in a general restlessness and fidgetiness of person the result of his ardent and nervous temperament which can hardly endure repose of mind or body 
he neither gives rest nor takes it his company is indeed in one sense only one fatiguing listening to him tires you like a journey you laugh till you are forced to lie down the medical gentlemen of the place are aware of this and are accustomed to exhort delicate persons to abstain from harry's society just as they caution them against temptations in point of amusement or of diet pleasant but dangerous choleric gentlemen should also avoid him and such as love to have the last word for though never provoked himself i cannot deny that he is occasionally tolerably provoking in politics especially and he is an ultra-liberal quotes cobbett and goes rather too far in politics he loves to put his antagonist in a fume and generally succeeds though it's nearly the only subject on which he ever listens to an answer chiefly i believe for the sake of a reply which is commonly some trenchant repartee that cuts off the poor answer's head like a razor very determined speakers would also do well to eschew his company though in general i never met with any talker to whom other talkers were so ready to give way perhaps because he keeps them in such incessant laughter that they are not conscious of their silence to himself the number of his listeners is altogether unimportant his speech flows not from vanity or lust of praise but from sheer necessity the reservoir is full and runs over when he has no one else to talk to he can be content with his own company and talks to himself being beyond a doubt greater in a soliloquy than any man off the stage where he is not known this habit sometimes occasions considerable consternation and very ridiculous mistakes he has been taken alternately for an actor a poet a man in love and a man beside himself <laughs> once in particular at windsor he greatly alarmed a philanthropic sentinel by holding forth at his usual rate while pacing the terrace alone and but for the opportune arrival of his party and their assurances that it was only the gentleman's way there was some danger that the benevolent soldier might have been tempted to desert his post to take care of him even after this explanation he gazed with a doubtful eye at our friend who was haranguing himself in great style sighed and shook his head and finally implored us to look well after him till he should be safe off the terrace you see ma'am observed the philanthropist in scarlet it is an awkward place for anybody troubled with vagaries suppose the poor soul should take a fancy to jump over the wall in his externals he is a well-looking gentleman of forty or thereabouts rather thin and rather pale but with no appearance of ill-health nor any other peculiarity except the remarkable circumstances of the lashes of one eye being white which gives a singular non-resemblance to his organs of vision every one perceives the want of uniformity and few can detect the cause some suspect him of what farriers call a wall eye some think he squints he himself talks familiarly of his two eyes the black and the white and used to liken them to those of our fine persian cat now alas no more who had in common with his feline countrymen one eye blue as a sapphire and the other as yellow as a topaz the dissimilarity certainly rather spoils his beauty but greatly improves his wit i mean the sense of his wit in others it arrests attention and predisposes to laughter is an outward and visible sign of the comical no common man has two such eyes they're made for fun in his occupations and pleasures harry is pretty much like other provincial gentlemen loves a rubber and jests all through at aces kings queens and knaves bad cards and good at winning and losing scolding and praise loves a play at which he out-talks the actors whilst on the stage to say nothing of the advantage he has over them in the intervals between the acts loves music as a good accompaniment to his grand solo loves a contested election above all 
that is his real element that din and uproar and riot and confusion to ride that whirlwind and direct that storm is his triumph of triumphs he would make a great sensation in parliament himself and a pleasant one by the way he was once in danger of being turned out of the gallery for setting all around him in a roar think what a fine thing it would be for the members to have mirth introduced into the body of the house to be sure of an honest hearty and good-humoured laugh every night during the session besides harry is an admirable speaker in every sense of the word jesting is indeed his forte because he wills it to be so and therefore because he chooses to play jigs and country dances on a noble organ even some of his staunchest admirers think he can play nothing else there is no quality of which men so much grudge the reputation as versatility of talent because he is so humorous they will hardly allow him to be eloquent and because he is so very witty find it difficult to account him wise but let him go where he has not that mischievous fame or let him bridle his jests and rein in his humour only for one short hour and he will pass for a most reverend orator logical pathetic and vigorous above all but how can i wish him to cease jesting even for an hour who would exchange the genial fame of good-humoured wit for the stern reputation of wisdom who would choose to be socrates if with a wish he could be harry l End of chapter twenty eight